All right, all right, all right, all right, and we are finally live. Hey, everybody, this is Roberto Blake, helping you create something awesome today. Welcome back to the channel. So, apologies for the delay on tonight's stream. We had massive electrical difficulties, believe it or not, and I had to have an entire receptacle and wiring replaced, and apparently I'm going to have to have an entire circuit and some, um, the entire circuit and an entire host of receptacles in this house replaced apparently soon, it's actually going to cost thousands of dollars. So that's the good news. Um, and by that, I mean the bad news. So tonight we're going to actually talk about making money, which is very practical considering I need to now make more of it uh, to handle some of these things. But we're going to have a good time. We're going to be talking about how you as a small YouTube channel can in fact make more money. And what we're going to do here is we're actually going to prioritize channels that are under 10,000 subscribers. We'll talk a little bit about people that are roughly in the 1,000 subscriber range who just reached monetization. All of you should be striving toward the goal of reaching 1,000 subscribers and YouTube partner program status and monetization because then you will get access to, excuse me, to access to the 10 types of revenue that YouTube actually provides to people in the partner program. And that's going to be extremely helpful to you when it comes to making more money and monetizing. But there are other methods that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about other monetization methods. I'm going to show you uh, some of my favorite methods and tactics for that. I'm going to teach you about monetizing the YouTube community tab as many of you do not do that. And we're gonna talk about things that you can start even if you're not in the YouTube Partner Program. There are ways to make money even if you're not in the YouTube Partner Program. I'm gonna to try to bring one of those up in another panel here. I'm gonna see if I can log into um, my Amazon Influencer account. I don't do a lot, to be honest with you, on my Amazon Influencer account these days. Um, I will when I start bringing back Tech Tuesdays for all of you. A lot of you have requested um, things on the budget camera gear. We are also giving away one of these cameras at 600K subscribers around with some microphones for small creators. And we'll be doing that. So this is an outdated. We'll be doing that at 600 subscribers. We'll be doing that at 700 subscribers. We'll do that all the way with every 100K milestone all the way to a million subscribers. We'll also be doing it when I hit 100K followers on Twitter. We're about to hit 90K over there very soon. So as my platforms grow, we will do some more small gear giveaways to the small creator community specifically. So um, we are giving away one of these Sony entry-level uh, cameras at 600K subscribers, along with several Deity microphones and a budget lighting kit. Um, and so I think that's going to help quite a few people. Now, when it comes to earning, if you have, let's say, less than 500 subscribers and the 3,000 hours of watch time for fan funding tier of YouTube, there are definitely things you can do. We're going to talk about that. We're going to go into monetization. Right now, I'm just pulling up one of my dashboards because I want to show you the back end of something you almost never see, which is the Amazon Influencer Program. We'll dive into the book sales and Amazon KDP because some of you could be um, making money if you just write an ebook, and that can be beneficial. Uh, so I'm going to show you some of the back end of this. So instead of having to guess or to like you know deal with um, weird abstract numbers, you're going to see actual real time numbers. I'm just trying to log into the back end here, so. Sorry for uh, delays on that. I'm just trying to get that worked out and sorted for you. Okay, great. So I'm going to share this screen with you. Share screen, Amazon Central. Ah, here you go. Okay. So Amazon Central says in a consolidated summary by store ID, and you can have multiple store IDs. You can also connect multiple stores, multiple languages on Amazon. And for the last 30 days, I haven't tried to grow on Amazon for sales, but $63 might not be a lot to me, but it could be a lot to a lot of you. But again, I'm not trying. If I wanted to try, I'll tell you what I do. Because back in the early days when I mostly did tech content in the early days of my channel, I actually used to make $1,500 a month from Amazon's uh, affiliate program, which was called Amazon Associates. Now they have the Amazon Influencer Program, which in some ways is much better. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that there are some items that are higher commissions than others. Now, I also, when I promote my book, I use my affiliate link. 
Um, you can see that that's okay for book sales, but book sales don't make you as much money or a ton of money. Uh, I'm also going to take this off of the last 30 days and try and see if I can just do it for um, this year to show you the highest uh, paying items on this. And I'll talk about these commission bounties. Again, I do not currently try very hard with uh, Amazon, but if I short by commission, I can show you that um, if you go into things like tech, for example, which is my category, the earnings you can get, even with a small audience, not a lot of clicks, because I want you to see this. I'm not trying and I'm getting clicks here and it's a decent conversion rate. Amazon clearly makes more money than me. But if you look at um, the commissions, if you sell high-end camera gear uh, through your affiliate links, you can see the substantial commissions that can be had. One high-end mirrorless camera, $179 commission. One high-end lens, $99 commission. Another high-end lens. This one, this lens is about a $1,000 lens. This $1,000 lens is worth $50 of a commission. It's $1,200 there, so that's the commission on it. You can see I don't get as much from individual book sales, but even products that aren't wildly expensive, some of these lighting gear kits and things like that, entry-level camera, the $500 entry-level camera, $20 commission. So if I wanted to make my first five, sorry, if I wanted to make my first $100, it's actually easier to make my first $100 on five sales of entry-level cameras than it is to make it off of YouTube ad revenue in most niches. Most YouTube ad revenue is going to be a $2 RPM to $5 RPM at best. So you are going to literally need probably more than 100,000 views, in some cases a million views, to get your first $100 on YouTube ad revenue through the partner program. But that's a lot. And meanwhile, if you even got a, uh, the right video, 10,000 clicks, you can make five or 10 sales that can get you your first $100 through the Amazon Influencer Program. You can even see with microphones that these are $16 commissions. To get $16, you might have to get 10,000, 5,000, 10,000 views on YouTube to get that same 16 to $20. You might have to get five, 10,000 views on YouTube. That's really hard. How many of those though, five, 10,000 views have to click on a link and buy it for you to make the same amount of money? So the thing is, while you're waiting to be monetized, the Amazon Influencer Program, while you have at least a few hundred subscribers or followers on another platform like Twitter, if you can get at least a couple hundred followers, I think it's 500 followers in any platform now if they qualify for the Amazon Influencer Program, you could start making money pretty much right away and, uh, and get a payout. So the, the threshold is uh, pretty reasonable for you to start making money here rather than just waiting on ad revenue from the YouTube Partner Program or donations from your audience. So you can see how this can be effective. And like I said, in a category like tech, I mean, book sales aren't hard to get here, but on a category like tech, you do uh, much better. And then there are bounties that you can get. And the bounties are for referrals on the Audible and Kindle memberships. Think about it. Kindle Unlimited Special Promos, Audible One Month, Audible uh, Trial, Audible Digital. I have $10, $5, and $3 commissions here. And again, it's not unreasonable to get people to sign up for these. So right off the bat, there's an opportunity right here, depending on your niche, to do this. And the thing is, you're like, well, no one will click on that in the links of my videos, Roberto. You're not using the YouTube Community tab. With the YouTube Community tab, you could be doing list of your favorite books. You could say, here's all the free things that you could do a trial of. You could promote all of this, and you could make some money right away using the YouTube Community tab and getting these bounty commissions and knowing that these are five and three dollar and ten dollar bounties that are out here for you. So, like, this is a massive, massive opportunity that is being overlooked to make your first money when you're not even in the YouTube partner program, as long as you have access to the YouTube community tab, you could be making this money on uh, using links on Twitter. You just always want to disclose. Uh, you could be posting on Facebook. If people need help with something, you could be DMing people in Facebook and saying, hey, are you looking for this? Are you, hey, do you want to sign up for a free ebook? Do you want to sign up for a free audiobook? Do you want a free trial to Kindle or Prime? Or hey, here's a list of uh, these 10 items. And again, these should be people you know. These should be people that would want a referral from you. Like I get referral request for, hey, Roberta, what's a good camera? What's a good light? What's a good microphone? 
and this is an opportunity. Now, to not get kicked out, you have to make a, like at least uh, three sales within the first 90 days, not entirely unreasonable. And if you do what I said with using the YouTube community tab, it is very easy to get those first sales and be in that program. So that's what I would recommend to a lot of you when it comes to that. And I think that it is a much more reasonable and quicker way to monetize than worrying about the watch time and subscriber requirements uh, for the uh, partner program. So that's that's what I would say. You know, and again, apologies to anybody for like me being late. Like I said, I had to literally have an electrician come out to make sure that we don't get interrupted for the stream. Um, Roberto, I want to improve my video editing. Which videos do you recommend from your videos? I used to use the Amazon influencer, uh, to improve your video editing, focus on speed. And there's an entire playlist on my YouTube channel that focuses on faster video editing. So if you go to my YouTube channel and you scroll down, um, it says start here to become a faster editor. And that will give you a great playlist with a lot of tips that you can use to become much faster and have a more efficient workflow. Question, does it matter if my paid promotion ad campaign demographic analytics is mostly views in another country in the U.S.? If it's a country outside the U.S., um, it could matter demographically. Uh, if you're doing paid promotion, I wouldn't do that to grow your audience at all. I don't believe in using the YouTube promote tab. We can talk about that later. I don't believe in using that. I only believe in using YouTube promote tab as it was intended. The reason you have a promote button in YouTube is not for creators, just like with Instagram, it's actually for e-commerce brands and businesses to promote themselves. So if you're in the US or anywhere in general, I don't recommend using the YouTube promote tab to grow an audience at all. I think it's hurting a lot of channels more than helping them. It's mainly made for brands because the interface in Google for Google video ads, and I say this as a Google video ads advertiser and user, is really outdated and it's really not great. So uh, for that the promo button is for brands and people who want to grow their email list, grow their e-commerce business, directly sell, um, or that have local businesses. That's who it's for, just like in Instagram and just like in Facebook. It's not meant for creators. Uh, Gabe says, uh, reducing areas of friction in my editing process workflow has put it up huge in time alone. Absolutely. That's why I recommend it. Um, and that's why I made that playlist specifically because time is the bottleneck that everyone has. So getting more efficient there would actually matter. So again, this is an immediate thing that many of you can do is you could sign up for the Amazon influencer program. And when you do, you also get a storefront, um, that you get. So in my case, I branded that as creator gear guide, which is, um, a channel that I never really fully got around to, um, to um, managing as much or as consistently as I would like, but eventually I'll go back to it. Um, and so when it comes to um, the Amazon influencer program, they give you that. And so when I go to it, Roberto Blake creator gear guide, where I did all of this, well, what you get is um, you have these items and um, different lists that I made that I can recommend. They also have this thing called ideas list. And so that's basically what this is. Um, I haven't uploaded and posted photos or videos um, that inspire uh, shoppers, but you can do that as part of their creator hub initiative. And you can do video reviews and those will be linked on Amazon in the influencer program. You can also do live QVC type things um, as well. So you can see I did things here like I have a list of items that you should get if you're doing online video courses that includes this uh, green screen that's very easy to use, very affordable. And so when people click on these, as long as they buy, um, you get an affiliate commission. I showed you the back end of what those payments can look like for varying items, gear and tech. This also works for beauty, lifestyle, books, anything really. And so um, it's about curating and you can earn commissions doing that. Like I said, they also have um, their creator hub where you can stream live on Amazon and um, basically do QVC and get commissions for doing that. So that's really a massive opportunity that is underrated. And like I said, I wanted to show you the back end and that's why I showed you, hey, here is even what they uh, paid me on the back end for those things. And 
here's like, you know, the uh, commissions. And like I said, for me, I'm not focused on this nearly as much, but I wanted to show you the opportunity it represents and that there is money to be made if you did focus on that. Um, again, it didn't take a lot of clicks and a lot of orders. This ultimately was just 300 orders. That's a relatively small audience for, and the conversion rate's really good for getting only 1500 clicks. So if you think about it, like how many views do you need to turn into clicks on these? If you do product reviews and you do things like that, then it's a, it's a buying audience it's a shopping audience. So your click through rate will be pretty high on those links. You can get a good conversion and then there's an opportunity to get good earnings out of this. And there, like I said, I showed you that there are different products that earn um, you know, higher than others. And if you can start to identify the products that earn higher than others, you could concentrate your videos around this. In my case, it'd be camera gear. And in my case, high-end camera gear, but even beginner camera gear, as you can see, could make me substantial money. If I got um, 50 people to buy um, these um, $500 entry level cameras, that's 50 people. What if I get like 10,000, 20,000 views on a video that is about entry level cameras under $1,000? If people buy the Sony vlogging camera, if I do 20,000 views on that video, which may not sound like a lot, don't I stand to make much more from getting 50 people out of 20,000 to buy a camera and then I make $1,000? It's more likely for me to make $1,000 that way than to make with ad revenue. And this is why tech YouTube uh, dominates so well and why um, it does so well in the market. So Home Rapid Repair says, hey, Roberto, I heard Amazon Influence Program is difficult to get accepted into. Uh, that has not been my experience or historically. I've seen many small content creators get into Amazon Influencer. I believe the current uh, program requirements, which I can look up for you right now, um, we can look at the requirements together. We could look at Amazon. Let me just type it in Amazon influencer program requirements. And we'll go to that tab when I have it up and we'll see what um, you actually need. Um, but I, I believe it is an established account with 500 organic followers. Um, but we will we'll look at that here and we'll try and see what it says. And then there's some Google results that claim it's, uh, you know, 500. But let's see. Uh, monetize your content with Amazon influencer program, build your storefront, earn blah, 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 blah. So what do we have to do? What do we have to do? <clears throat> Frequently asked questions. How do I qualify for this? Uh, we accept applications for all types of influencers provided have YouTube, Instagram, or TikTok. Um, you're required to use a business account. How much will I earn? Okay. So there, um, other places have the requirements. So let's try and see what it says. What requirements do you need to get into the Amazon Influencer Program? Uh, in most cases, it usually says if you have over 200 followers, um, but it's better to have at least 1,000 followers to increase your chance of getting selected. Other places suggest 500. So it looks like anywhere between, anywhere between 200 and a thousand in any platform or combination of platforms seems to be the case. So that seems to be what we have um, to to deal with here. Um, now, it used to be for the old affiliate program way back in the day, you needed to have more, but um, you can definitely do it if you're smaller. Uh, I have seen it done. We've seen plenty of people doing it. And again, if you want to qualify, sometimes TikTok is the fastest way to qualify since you can grow a following pretty rapidly over there with um, quote unquote minimal effort, um, as they would say. Um, again, not saying it's uh, like it's totally no effort to grow TikTok, but usually a lot of people will grow TikTok faster than any other platform. So you could use that, get into the program that way by growing TikTok faster. For some people, they can grow Instagram pretty rapidly with reels. So Instagram and TikTok are probably the fastest thing you could grow that gets you into the Amazon Influencer Program. If you're already established somewhat on YouTube, then you could probably do it. You home rapid repair, you're at 2,700 subs on YouTube. You should be able to get approved into the partner program. Um, yeah, if you have 500, definitely try it again. 
What's the key difference between the Amazon Associates program and Amazon Influencer program? These days, I think that they've basically conflated it to be the same. But I think the Amazon Influencer program is easier to get into since you don't have to have a website. And then they don't check your website traffic. So that would be the primary difference. But functionally, I think at this point, functionally, they are essentially the same or they've been consolidated into the same system. That is my understanding. Does eBay have an affiliate program? I believe that eBay does have an affiliate program. I'm not a thousand percent sure about how that affiliate program works. But um, speaking of... Um, affiliate programs. I'm going to show you um, something, but also I want to, let me try something. I'm going to try and sign into one of my affiliate uh, programs here and bring that up on my dashboard for all of you so that we can um, try and get you some other data that you don't normally see. Um, so I'm going to try and see if I can log into that dashboard here. Um, I have this in incognito mode for reasons, uh, but I'll try and see what I can do about logging in and trying to get you a little bit more data that you can look at that you almost never, ever, ever see. Um, so let's see here. Um, wait a minute. Am I hearing an echo? Oh, wait, there we go. Um, so let's see. Give me one quick second. Uh, sign in with Google, blah, 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 blah. One moment, blah, 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 blah. We could not log you in. Okay, I'll try it um, in my other tab here. So give me a quick second. Because what I want to do is I want to show you guys um, something called Partner Stack. And if I can show you this, then I don't have a lot of commissions in here. I almost never look at it. But what I want to do is I want to show you um, like uh, previous things that I've done with this. Um, I think this one... At least if I show you this, then I can show you options. So this one is called um, Partner Stack. And it has offers for affiliates programs and they have an affiliate marketplace. Um, this company ended its program, but I referred three people through this for Bench and I made a commission of um, $1,200 plus, like $1,200 plus on it with three referrals. Like... Um, that's crazy with just three referrals. So there's a lot of good stuff out there. And there's a marketplace for all kinds of what they do here. This is an affiliate marketplace and it's called Partner Stack. And here you can find all kinds of software companies and service companies, and you can apply to be part of their network. Now I have more than one Partner Stack account because I forgot that I signed up with my Google account with one of them. And so I have more things that I'm signed up for there. But I think this is the one where I earned the most commissions. I get a couple, I think 50 to $100 a month commissions on the other one. But this shows you that there's a huge marketplace that you can apply to. And you obviously use your social media program uh, profiles. Now, I don't think you have to have huge stats you'd like at all to get into Partner Stack. I don't think, I think anyone can join Partner Stack. But when you apply, when you apply, individual affiliate programs here will either approve or deny you. So as long as these things are aligned with your audience, and for many of you, it may not be if you're not in tech, business, or uh, education content, uh, hardware, software, that sort of thing, or HR, then or, or web design or hosting or any of that stuff may not benefit you as much. I mean, Fiverr has one here. Like, so th this may or may not work out for a lot of you in terms of options, but they have so many affiliate programs here. It's hard to believe that nothing would match your audience at all, unless of course you're probably more of an entertainer, but they have other little things. I mean, like there's password protectors. So that, I mean, that's good for like everybody. There's um, a few productivity things here. So there's a lot to offer. But as I said, when, it, when we look at it for me, again, I was able to earn on three referrals before they closed that particular, um, 
that particular program I, on three referrals, I was able to make $1,300. So again, rarely do you see um, the back end of how any YouTubers make their money. Some will share their AdSense earnings with you, but a lot of them don't talk about opportunities that exist outside the YouTube partner program, how you can earn with that. And even when they do, they don't always share what the um, earnings would look like for that. Uh, for me, also, if you write a book or an ebook um, with both physical and um, digital copies, I don't have the audiobook ready yet, but these are things where you can see like estimated royalties. If I go to royalties and I um, go instead of this month, if I just go to lifetime so you can see uh, when I published my book in September, what I've earned with it, I've earned uh, $15,000 for my book um, with uh, my sales. Um, you know, so that's good. And the overwhelming majority of that was split between uh, print and ebook royalties there, as you can see. So it's about roughly the same for me. So it's, it pays to do both. Um, I would argue that I make just barely slightly more on the print books than on the eBooks, um, more if people buy the hardcover. So I went hardcover, paperback, and Kindle. Um, the fourth thing I need to do is finish Audible. Audible will literally double my sales easily. Um, and my book's only been out one year, basically. So uh, since my book's been only out one year, this is actually really good and really sustainable. And as I said, if I had released an audiobook, the audiobook would have made more than the print and eBook uh, combined. So it would have been... Thirty to forty thousand dollars that I would have made if I released the audiobook at the same time. Once I get the audiobook out before the end of this year, that will be the thing that puts me over the top, and I'll make a lot more from that. Also, by using my own affiliate link, I can get some uh, commissions and get a little bit, just like a little edge, a little bit more money out of that. So, um, this is really decent. It's harder to write a book than to make merch, but the um, net profit is about roughly the same. Uh, Brianna Fleming says, love my book. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, Brianna, if you haven't already, I absolutely need a five-star rating and review on Amazon for my book from you. Um, and that goes for any of you who um, have read my book. I definitely need the ratings and reviews on Amazon. So Munch Daddy says, are affiliate programs or ad revenue best for a cooking channel? Um, a combination of both. There is like, so saying what's the best revenue comes down to your own skills, your niche, your channel, your audience's buying power. It's very hard to say. Um, because also, you theoretically make more money when you sell anything, whether it's your own product, which we will talk about, your own digital product, or it's other people's product. You make the most money selling things versus ad revenue majority of the time. Um, across most niches, the all, the only time that's not true is if you are a viral creator, and that's only in theory. In theory, if you are a viral creator, you should still make more money unless you have a super young, super broke audience. Um, unless you have a super young, super broke audience, in theory, you should still make more money selling things than you do off of your ad revenue and off of the YouTube Partner Program. And the truth is, even for Mr. Beast, with all the views he gets, he still says that he makes more money from Feastables and merchandise. Both of those are his direct-to-consumer side. He still says he makes more money from um, Feastables and from um, his merchandise line, his print-on-demand merchandise, than he does from his YouTube partner revenue. So based on that alone, I would argue that selling anything, whether it's through another company, through affiliate or a partnership or your own products, tends to make more even in proportion to views because there's enough of the people who will watch that that will convert to uh, buyers and the ratio of money is just higher from a buyer than it is from a viewer. A buyer still is worth more than a thousand eyeballs in general. Because remember, a thousand eyeballs on YouTube is only going to be worth, in most cases, $5, 10 max. If you sell a book, you make $7 for selling a book. If you sell a t-shirt, hat, or hoodie, you make somewhere between $5 to $12. One sale is still better than a thousand eyeballs every time. So it's a one to 1,000 and the one beats the 1,000. 
So that means that you don't even need a 1% conversion rate. You need a 0.1% conversion rate for selling to outdo YouTube. Now, as long as the commissions on an affiliate will be higher than a five to ten dollar CPM, even the affiliate marketing side is still more valuable than YouTube AdSense when you look at it by the numbers, by the math. And I prove that with everything I'm showing you here and on these back end systems. So, from that standpoint alone, it just makes much more sense. So, I think the numbers when we break it down are pretty undeniable. Um, now what I'm about to do is I'm about to do something that nobody does. I'm about to show you the back end for my coaching business, Awesome Creator Academy, which we've been talking about a lot more. Here's the back end for my coaching business that also includes my membership website. So the back end for that is that over the last 12 months between September of 2022, September of 2023, it's done over $100,000 in revenue um, all time. And so the thing is, we've only done a few small refunds, and those refunds largely centered around billing errors where someone's like, hey, I forgot to cancel my membership. Can you refund me for this month? And so we, we do that when people forget. And that's where our small, insignificant, less than 1% of, uh, less than 1% of all refunds come from. Now, what makes the most money? It's my time. Coaching directly makes my most money. The pro group um, after that has more than one offer tied to it. So the pro group has a couple of um, people who had old school memberships that cost a different thing. Some people pay for the year up front and are on a yearly plan instead of a monthly plan, so on and so forth. So it's broken up into multiple offers, but the pro group probably makes the most money by itself. Then it's my 90-minute coaching calls. We've done our live brand deals workshops, brand deal starter kits, probably our best-selling digital product this year, but maybe not for all time, but for this year. And so that's done money. So that's microtransactions. And then uh, we have things like the um, uh, creator prompts, chat GPT. We have my multiple coaching calls. Uh, we've had one premium client for that. So six grand package there. Then we've done other small transactions on digital products for over 20 grand there. So again, that's kind of the breakdown. Um, and I've been doing this since uh, about like 2018. So about roughly five years. So we've done pretty significant revenue over that time. Again, a lot of people, this is not the stuff that they will um, show you, but this is the back end. And the system I'm using here is um, Kajabi. Now, could I do that with a smaller audience? Well, when I started this, I did have over 100,000 subscribers for my style of coaching and what I offer. You kind of need that credibility. But let's say you were doing some other type of thing. If you were doing something else <clears throat> that doesn't require YouTube credibility or social media social proof, let's say you were doing stuff where you were um, teaching freelancing, for example, teaching people how to be a freelancer. You don't need 100,000 subscribers on YouTube to make money doing a coaching business around that. You don't really need much of a following in YouTube at all to prove yourself as a freelancer and start doing coaching services, doing calls, or doing a group program, a membership, selling courses. We haven't even moved into course sales yet. When we do, that'll do very well because uh, we're launching the brand deals course. So what I would say is even if you're a small YouTuber, it depends on your background, your skills, your profession, and your packaging if you want to go into the digital products. If you want to go into the digital products, I would go into smaller products and um, like micro products and micro transactions, and you can do very well. I use Kajabi because I do some bigger items and I do a group membership. Group memberships can be great, but again, you might need more social credibility for that. What I will tell you, though, and I'm about to show you something else in my back end, is what I would look at is in terms of some of our offers, let's see. In terms of some of our offers, I can show you something here on the back end. So something with um, our offers is we have a $9.99 offer called uh, chat GPT creator prompts. These are our creator prompts. We've uh, done very well with this. You can see that with like $9.99 products, we've done $2,000 on that. And we launched that earlier this year, probably at the end of summer. So that's not very old. After that, we just recently launched something else that we've done 122 sales on. And that is the creator starter pack. 
And that's another $9 product. We've done uh, $1,000 on that. You can see it doesn't take a lot to make $1,000 if you have a $9 product. Many of you can make $9 digital products and do very well for yourself. And we haven't pushed and promoted these things as hard. I've just started pushing them more in the live streams. In fact, if you want to get some of our entry-level products to see what we offer, I've linked to some of them in the description down below the video. But you can see having um, low ticket offers can produce significant revenue. Obviously, if you have recurring revenue offers um, like a membership, then you can do significant profits off of that. And so you can see, again, like that can do six figures for you. Um, the YouTube starter kit by itself is my best digital product as a standalone digital download product that has done over $100,000 in sales. So um, again, um, that is... Uh, my best seller, and we've sold that to over 1,600 people. The brand deal starter kit is almost cracked $20,000. We've only sold that to less than 300 people. So these are my $99 products, and you can kind of see the difference between a $99 product and a $9.99 product. So again, opportunities here. If you have the right background and the right buying audience, digital product sales don't have to be thousand users to start making you some decent money at least to get started so again there is opportunity to be have um did you ever do voiceovers i did them a long time ago think about getting back into that if you do that do it on acx and get royalties choose royalties over more upfront payment uh we have a super chat i need to get to so Trish, the natural $10 super chat. Thank you very much. Says, hi, Roberta. I have a small hair beauty lifestyle channel, 900 subs. Congratulations. I want to promote my print on demand t-shirts. Any suggestions? Okay. So with print on demand merchandise, what a lot of you are running into as a problem is this. A lot of you are making it uh, about your logo and your brand and people would have to really, really be emotionally invested and care about you for you to make money like that. There's a much, much, much better strategy for um, doing this. And you have to go to culture and, and, and identity instead of um, caring, having people care more about your um, brand specifically. So that's something a lot of people do not understand, and that's something that um, hurts a lot of uh, creators when it comes to uh, just a basic understanding of the um, the overall, uh, how do I say this, the, the overall viability and potential of their sales and what they have to offer becomes much, much, much more limited if they focus on themselves and on their like their logo and their brand identity than if they just primarily focused on the like the culture and identity of the audience and use that to their advantage in order to uh, best understand what people will buy and how they will buy um now let me see here there's um i'm trying to find something to show you merchandise because you're saying specifically you want to uh do print on demand stuff and you want to um leverage that i'm looking for i'm looking for something that will show kind of like i can show you what the commissions are but um in terms of the uh, what the, uh, what do you call it? What is it? The margins, the margins and the profitability, the margins and profitability of some of my, um, print on demand products are, I'm trying to log into both Teespring and Spreadshop and show you, um, both of those. And, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring up a way to show sales over time more easily, which is not um, as easy as it sounds, given the way the interface works. So um, I'm trying to, it doesn't really give me a way to go, oh, just show lifetime earnings. It's like, it's not um, as easy as that. So um, I just grabbed um, the best date that I theoretically can um, to show you some potential 
uh, margins and sales and what made me the most. Um, this will not be comprehensive lifetime earnings, by the way. This will just be the best estimate I can give you for a period of time. So I just grabbed 2019, even though I sold stuff before that. So um, here, um, so like I just grabbed from 2019 to now, and I moved most of my stuff over to Spreadshop from uh, Teespring or what they call Spring for Creators. So the thing is, there is a product that made me um, the most uh, money, um, and it was the which one was it? Um, orders, orders, orders. Uh, which one had the most orders and sales? There's one here that had what was it? Profit. There's one here that had five hundred profit here somewhere. Hang on. Uh, give me a second. Units, uh, profit. I'm trying to make this big enough for you guys to be able to see it. Um, ah, here it is. So this particular, oh wait, there's more items here. Hang on. Okay. Uh, can I sort by profit? Um, it looks like it does it weird. Okay. Anyway. So selling 49 of the creator V2 design was worth $542. I'm trying to make this bigger so that you guys can see it, but it, I don't know if it, ah, uh, wait, here it is. Okay. Um, hang on. So this, uh, selling, what is it? Um, 64 units, 64 units of the creator V2 design did $454 and change, okay? One design, 64 sales. Now, if I had concentrated on merch, and again, I switched over from Teespring to Spreadshop, and there's reasons, and I'll get to that later, um, but I still have both. Um, this design did really well. So imagine if I had concentrated on trying to sell as many of these as I did my YouTube starter kit. Now, I made more money from my YouTube starter kit by selling it to 1600 creators. But the margin on these shirts for me was pretty significant. The margin was about roughly, mm, let's say $8. So again, if I sold a thousand of those or 1600 of those, if I sold 1600 of those with a profit margin of $8, then I would have made $1,200. However, by selling my own digital product for $99 to 1,600 people, um, even with discounts and coupons, I made over $100,000 that way. So again, print on demand versus me selling a higher margin product. And again, it's higher margin, but let's even analyze how quickly I was able to sell a $99 product that has no cost against it. Digital downloads, I sold um, you know, um, quite a few of those and made similar profits. My book took me longer to write but I sold more of my book at a similar profit margin. And for my audience, because my audience is education-based, it was easier for me to sell more books than it was T-shirts. Now, if you're a natural hair beauty lifestyle channel, print on demand isn't a bad idea. But the thing is, for the effort you take to sell print on demand merchandise, you're probably better off selling uh, an affiliate link to Amazon to different high end lifestyle things and curating list over there. You probably make more from the Amazon influencer program than you will from t-shirts. If you did some kind of book, I think that you might actually make more from books than if you sold t-shirts, even as a small channel as well. And as a small channel, even if you grew making your first $100 is much harder in the partner program than in doing any of these sales. So if you look at it, there are some products that work better for some audiences in most things. But if we look at it by the numbers, and this is why I tell a lot of people, I'm not trying to drag down the YouTube partner program or AdSense, far from it. But by every measurement we've come up with, it's easier to make money with merchandise, books, digital products, affiliate links in Amazon than AdSense, and it's not even close. It's not even close, you guys. We've seen it by the numbers. You've seen it with your own eyes. Even on memberships, 
We've seen it. But again, the best opportunities for the small content creator are not $99 products unless you have expertise in social proof. And that's not your follower account. It could be a credential, could be a certification, could be your day job, could be the business, could be that you um, run a business that's completely different than social media and you have other social proof awards and accolades, certifications, education, degrees. If you have a degree in something, no one's going to argue with you making a $99 product or a $200 to $500 course if you have a degree in the background in that thing. No one will argue with you if you have a degree for the most part. And the thing is, with one sale of that, you are better off than getting a million views in YouTube. If you get one to two sales, it's more revenue than a million views in YouTube in most cases. So just keep that in mind. Now, there are niches that, are ex that exclude that to where, yeah, if you're in a high-end niche like me, a million, two million views is worth more than the course sales, but not for most people. Digital products, if you, I mean, again, if you're in an entertainment niche, the ad revenue is abysmal by comparison to the education niche. But the education niche, the views tend to be lower overall unless you're Graham Stephan or someone. But there's more money to be made in selling digital products. And if you're a small creator, you can't do brand deals right away, but the brand deals get really, really good at some point. But the opportunities, if you have expertise in something through the Amazon affiliate program, SaaS affiliates, which you can find through things like Partner Stack, like I showed you. I showed you Partner Stack, showed you the Amazon Influencer Program. But then even with these print-on-demand companies, because another one I have besides Teespring, like we said, is Spreadshop. And I think, I don't know if I can, sh I don't know if it'll give me the raw sales numbers. It'll. I think it just gives you, it gives you this weird thing. I'll just show you. I think it just gives me what the earnings will be on the item based on the profit margin I set or something like that. I think it's just based on the profit margin. Um, I don't know. But again, um, so I like, yeah, I don't know what it like, how it displays that. It just shows profit margin, I think. I think it shows the retail price and then it shows the earning if I make a sale on it. So um, that's what it is there. Um, says sales at a glance, um, earnings from this order. Like, I don't know. I don't know how it explains this, to be honest with you. <laughs> so I just look at the money it puts in my bank account and then I'm done with it. Um, so, uh, some dashboards are cleaner than others. That's what I'll say about it. Um, so again, Yes, do is YouTube ad revenue good and do I make great YouTube ad revenue? I, I would say for the amount of views and the lack of uploads on my part, yes. Um, however, I don't necessarily think that for a smaller content creator that that's uh, the game plan or what to prioritize. Like I said, I think it's faster to make $100 or $1,000 through these other methods and I showed you why. So... Um, for you in your niche, I actually think the Amazon influencer is better than print on demand because I don't really see your audience being as much of a print on demand audience, if that makes sense. Uh, your audience for this, there's more things that they like that are useful to them in the Amazon influencer program than wearing your t-shirt with your logo. But if it was, it'd still be a man. Um, if you want to sell print on demand, you sell culture, not your logo. Figuring ish out ten dollars super chat. Thank you. Um, you're in the manosphere space. Any suggestions on how to monetize a niche in uh, the market? Mostly, I believe that that's going to be memberships, donations. Um, if you have some kind of um, self improvement angle, maybe if you're a personal trainer, you have a program there. Um, you can obviously come up with some personal development course charisma on command for example they're not exactly in your niche but they're close enough they teach um public speaking and confidence so that could be something there's obviously the course angle in terms of a digital product suite there's the donations there's ad revenue obviously um and then in theory there's merchandise in theory uh around that maybe most likely though it's going to be selling some kind of coaching or course that has some self-improvement angle on either wealth building. Um, Cause what do we all care about? What is it? They say, is it um, wealth, health, happiness, and relationships, I think is the four things that always sell. So you would build something around one of those four items. Um, the most 
profitable one is probably if you have some business development angle versus a mere uh, personal development angle. Um, so something that might be more related to improving personal finance, financial literacy, um, credit card hacking, if you have um, a points system and everything like the credit guy, the credit guy, or is it the points guy? I think his name is the points guy. The points guy is a massive um, angle on financial literacy, but also leveraging credit and credit card points. So that's something that um, is possible. Um, Roberto, what do you recommend as a platform for selling digital products? Um, it depends on your budget, because if you want to sell digital products, courses, and coaching, uh, because I use it and I can also teach how to use it properly and give you advice if you get stuck, I will often recommend Kajabi because it's what I use and because I am an affiliate for it. But, uh, and obviously, you know, I love my affiliate uh, money. However, the good news is if you use Kajabi, I know how to use the system, which means I can create content that helps you use it properly. Or if you get stuck on saying, say, hey, I need to know how to do this, I have an answer. And me and a lot of the bigger creators use it. Ali Abdal uses it as well. So there is um, a benefit there. I'm going to link to... Uh, Kajabi in the description of this. I'm also going to paste my link to it here in the chat, but uh, use Kajabi to sell digital products, courses, and membership because it can do all of them. Um, digital products, courses, and memberships. Uh, free trial. So I'm going to post a link to the free trial of Kajabi if any of you want to check that out. The best angle for it is membership websites and coaching. So I'm dropping that in here for you. Again, I feel like this is massively, massively useful. I pay for it. It's a little bit more expensive. Now, if you're a beginner selling digital products, many of my students um, have used Gumroad and they've used that successfully for their first small ticket items. And Gumroad had some controversy over its uh, shift on its payment processing and pricing. So do keep that in mind, but it's fine to use Gumroad. You can also use Selfy. Um, both of those are good. Some people like Send Owl. So those are the more budget-friendly places to sell digital products. Like I said, for membership websites that need to be robust and for coaching courses and digital products, I recommend Kajabi. They're not a sponsor, but I do some promo for them. And um, so they run some ads telling my story and I'm also an affiliate and I might be hosting a workshop or a seminar for them. Um, they obviously are going to pay me when I do that. So it's a different deal than a sponsorship, but it is a public speaking engagement. However, that is another way that if you have a reputation, even if you're small, you could get into public speaking. I got into public speaking when I had 30, 40,000 subscribers, I think. Uh, maybe a little bit less than that, expertise and proven expertise with some social media following can get you into public speaking and you don't have to be huge. I've seen people do it with 10,000 or less. So that's an opportunity. Uh, Patrick Sterling. Hey, how's it going? 40K channel just crossed the milestone of making more from digital products in the last year than my full-time salary. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, digital products uh, can definitely be great. Like I said, Amazon Affiliate and Amazon Influencer are basically the same thing now. The difference is social media versus website traffic as the qualifier. So, Michelle, that's your answer. <clears throat> um, Tris, the natural, says, I plan to have culture-focused T-shirts. I want to promote my print on demand t-shirts on my YouTube platform without having to mention it during videos, then I would recommend this strategy. More of you should be using the YouTube community tab to be promoting your products. And what I'm going to do is I'll show you where I think I've done it a couple of times on mine and you can take advantage of this. Uh, let me try and pull that up for you. So you can use the YouTube community tab and directly sell to your audience. Uh, I need to do this more myself. I need to do it at least once a week, but I need to do more community tab stuff so that it doesn't feel overly salesy. But if I show you um, the YouTube community tab, um, let's see. 
if I show you the YouTube community tab here, so if you use the YouTube community tab and I've used it to post a bunch of stuff, so I guess I'm entitled to use it for my next sale. But um, what I recommend is that you eventually, wow, it's been a minute since I promoted something to sell. Ah, here we go. Okay, great. So here we go. I promoted my awesome Creator Academy Pro Group in the YouTube community tab where I link to it and it goes out uh, to the landing and sales page. So if I click on that, it would take you like here where you can sign up for the pro group membership and um, you know you can choose those options. It answers all your questions. It tells you what it, you get, tells you about me and uh, my co-instructor. And uh, it basically um, gives you everything you would need to know. Now, what I did was you can get to that from um, something I shared in the community tab a month ago. See, it's been a month since I promoted it. I should be promoting every week. But you make a graphic. You make a one-by-one -one ratio graphic. You can use Photoshop or Canva. You tell people what you get. You answer questions in the comments. Um, you promote it. And it's a great way to market. And it's free for you to uh, market yourself that way. Um, I did one here with um, the starter kit stuff as well. And so, boom, and I offered a discount code and uh, people could buy from that. And I believe that made me some money. So again, if you have merchandise and or digital products, there's no good reason you can't be promoting them in the community tab of your YouTube channel. I recommend doing that weekly as long as you're doing other things. You may have noticed it's been a month since I did that. I've been promoting other things, even other channels, and just giving you guys more value than just trying to sell things. Now, you can also use these prominent links. Uh, your main one, mine is going to my group membership, like I said, the Awesome Creator Academy Pro Group. Um, in my about section, I decide to take a page of Mr. Beast book and I list my real world accomplishments so far and what I've done, um, all the things. So I did that, but then in the down below, you get to my links and then you have all the links for my business. These things are all links that make me money. So um, join the pro group, one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, with me. Um, so you just see it better. Yeah, join the pro group, one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, brand deal starter kit, YouTube starter kit, creator prompts, newsletter, affiliate link for StreamYard, buy my book, sign up for Kajabi, enjoy the podcast, follow me on Twitter and X. So boom. Um, you So if, again, if you want to promo your stuff, this is how you do it. You use YouTube to promote it without making a video. Use the community tab, use your prominent links feature, um, if you have um, the 1,000 subscribers uh, for full monetization, you even get a store tab where you can use um, Spreadshop, Teespring, and Shopify and link to your stores and sell your items and sell your merchandise. So boom, you have that right here. And so this is another way to make money. YouTube does not take a cut from this. So that's the YouTube shopping feature. And again, you can do that as a smaller content creator. If you have the 500 subscribers, you can obviously do memberships, super chat donations, all the fan funding options. So boom, there you go. Yeah, all of you should be, thank you, Stephen V. Tran. Like, yeah, all of you should be following me over on Twitter. How do you do it with loneliness as a creator? Uh, become part of communities, communicate with people online. Find some people locally if you can. Talk to people in real life. Don't build your entire identity around your creator identity. Treat it like a career and job. It's nice to have colleagues and work friends you can talk to. But live more in the real world instead of being obsessed with talking about YouTube. Much harder for a lot of young people, though. Screenwriting uh, Scribe says, I have a channel on screenwriting software tutorials as well as a general screenwriting, about 970 subs. What are some good ways to monetize my channel? Thanks. Uh, with you, consider selling some affordable digital product that is uh, $10 or more. Eventually, a $99 product is really good for you. Also, if there are things that people um, would benefit from in terms of software, obviously do all the affiliate links for different software, review different software. That's going to be doing very well for you. Like I said, I um, benefit a lot from the affiliate marketing side. So I highly recommend an encouragement. Um, and that would be the angle that I would go with uh, for the far majority of you that have um, a channel that 
involves software of any kind, I would review software that you can do affiliate marketing for. And a lot of those have recurring revenue attached to them. Uh, in a minute, I'll show you probably what my best affiliate looks like, which we all know is TubeBuddy. Uh, shout out to our homies over at TubeBuddy. I'll be seeing them at VidSummit. Um, as soon as it lets me log in here. Um, relying on AdSense for edgier content is a roller coaster ride. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So um, for this one, my lifetime revenue from TubeBuddy has obviously been very good. Over the months, it's declined a little bit, but uh, we move on. But as you can see, I get pretty good commissions here. It's comparable to my AdSense revenue. And so I've converted a lot of lifetime uh, sales to them um, and installs. So very good revenue from TubeBuddy overall. Um, this used to be more, but again, recession, blah, 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 blah. So again, as long as I can keep it in the 3000 range, we're all Gucci. Um, I also could do a better job of promoting more and getting more installs, purchases, and sign ups. I don't think this is bad um, in terms of numbers, but it could be better. So um, again, not driving as many clicks. I used to drive more clicks. If I do promote it more, it will grow more. It'll obviously convert more. If 100 and something clicks converts to 12 installs and 30 sales, then that's actually really good. So that means if I drove 1,000 clicks, it's obviously going to 10x more. So the goal for me in this should be driving 1,000 clicks a month. So that's a good way to kind of um, reverse engineer that. But again, this has done very well for me. Um, so no complaints on my side with TubeBuddy as an affiliate. But again, showing you the back end. That's how good software as a service stuff can be. Remember, TubeBuddy is literally splitting uh, with me 30 to 50% commissions in most cases, 30 to 50% commissions on what is a $5 all the way up to a $50 a month plan. Most people do the $5 a month plans. So again, it's a lot of installs to get up there in numbers, but it can be very good. Um, but if I'm making that kind of money from a small ticket item in terms of recurring revenue, there's plenty of opportunities with bigger things. Can you get monetized on Twitter? I believe with Twitter, it's, what is it now? 500 followers. You have to have, I believe, 5, 5 million impressions over the last 90 days. You have to be a premium user. And then it's based on impressions from premium users. So that is the deal. Um, Scott asks, how is the brand deal uh, course going along? It, will it be beneficial for small creators? Um, it's probably the most beneficial, unless you just want to do the prep work of understanding brand deals early. It's probably best for people that have at least a thousand subscribers in YouTube or more and are already monetized, to be honest with you. However, um, in terms of the overall usefulness, in terms of the ability to execute and be educated, it is valuable to anyone by the time they're ready to do a brand deal, it is valuable to them. If you're not ready to do brand deals, all it is is the perfect education and prep before you're ready. It's not going to take someone who can, has 500 subscribers and all of a sudden make them $5,000 or $500. It's not designed to do that. And nothing really is because that wouldn't be fair to brands to be very honest with you. So the thing is, it will be like a $500 course, but anyone who is monetized, it could benefit them because they are on the way to being ready. I tell most people that before you worry about getting a brand deal at 1,000 subscribers, maybe you should grow to 5,000, 10,000 subscribers because it is so hard to get to 5,000, 10,000 subscribers. You might as well spend all of your energy on achieving the hardest goal. And then everything will be easier from that because 90% of people just can't get 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. 90% of people cannot get 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. If you focus all of your energy on that, instead of diverting it to brand deals, then you're probably fine. The best thing you could probably do is affiliate marketing because that's gonna help you get brand deals later. And I talk about that in the course. You make money right away while you're small doing affiliate marketing. You can do your own print on demand sales or your own digital product sales. That's gonna help you sell yourself to a brand. So the thing is selling something is faster than brand deals. It's faster than AdSense. It proves you to brands. And if you grow the audience while also trying to sell, you make more money. So the thing is that eliminates the desperation to get a brand deal and it positions you better for it. The course also talks about that. So the thing is, the course is when you're ready to get a brand deal, it's the right thing to have 
If you want to buy it before you're ready, you can always learn and train, but it's not going to magically make you ready because you have it. It is for when you are ready. And it will make sure that you do better and that you charge more appropriately and that you are prepared to sell and negotiate and that you understand red flags and can avoid uh, brand deal scams and things like that. So that's that's who the brand deals course is geared for. And that's what will make sense. Uh, screenwriting Scribe says, I will do more of my software affiliate links in the community page as well. Good stuff. Yep, I think it's good stuff. I think it's massively helpful to go more in this direction. I think that this is the information that people really need. And like I said, there is, um, there's backend stuff that most people never share. The views and subs matter more than likes and comments. Uh, yes. Short answer is yes. Uh, no brainer language. Brazil says I'm past 1000 subscribers and aside from my job and some side hustles, I'm honestly not sure about business model. I'm trying to grow without a clear plan is pretty uncertain if possible. Then in your case, I would focus on trying to get to 10,000 subscribers and you can learn as much as you can along the way. Maybe more clarity will come as you grow. So I would worry less about the business model for now, since you have side hustles and you have a job. If you have side hustles and you have a job, Worry less about um, the business model for right now. Focus on learning more, growing more, getting to 10,000 subscribers because it'll matter more and you'll qualify for more if you do it. Which is better to have now? More short videos or long videos? Long videos pay more. Long videos pay more. Shorts will grow your subscriber count. It'll get you reach and it'll pay you nothing. It's not really viable in terms of if you care about money. If you're a grown adult and you care about money, shorts doesn't make you any money. And now that you can't have links in the shorts, I'm not sure it's even good for brand deals anymore. If we're being perfectly honest. Should you use your YouTube shorts to drive viewers to your long form content and use that as a form of posting consistently between longer form videos? You can. And then you can see if your audience responds to it. Your mileage may vary. YouTube has some very specific data around that. I have my skepticism around it. But um, your mileage will vary when it comes to the efficacy of shorts. Would you mind sharing what program you use, if any, to become a coach? I've seen looking into becoming a life coach as well. I mean, it's not to become a coach. I didn't use a program to become a coach. I... I had background in training people when I worked in corporate America. I did sales training. I did software training. So um, I even did some uh, gig for a while as a substitute art teacher. So um, I didn't have to go through a program to become a coach. And I didn't take any coaching certification. I just taught what I knew. And in terms of a program or system I used to sell the coaching, it's Kajabi. I've linked to it in the chat. I've linked to it in the description. Um, here it is in the chat again. So... Um, I didn't take any certification to become a coach. I mean, you can if you're doing life coaching, I guess you need a certification. I don't know how life coaching works really. Um, so if you need a certification for that, have at it. But um, I used my professional background and my results, and I decided to coach content creators based on results I've proven I could produce. I produced those results over and over with multiple creators. I've coached relatively 500 creators. I think like maybe almost more than 50 of them have gotten silver play buttons. Um, I'm having my um, clients start to ship me copies of their play buttons, as many as will do it. I think I only like 10 should be enough in terms of credibility and social proof, but I have 50 clients I'm doing case studies on um, that have gotten silver play buttons. I have over 40 trust pilot reviews. So, I mean, that's how I'm doing it um, in terms of social proof beyond my own results, showing off some of my, clients results. I'm bringing clients onto the podcast and onto panels, talking about some of the things we did and their own creator journey, highlighting them, uh, elevating them also elevates me. So, I mean, that's the smart approach to coaching in the social media context of it. If you did something else like fitness, for example, like Mike Diamonds, Dr. Mike Diamonds is a client of mine, over a million subscribers. One of the things he does is he shows the results of his clients in his videos itself. That makes total sense. And that's how that business generates new clients and leads. So um, that's how you would think about it. I'm not sure how life coaching works, though.
Oh, wow. Shorts really messed up your channel. Um, sorry to hear that. Off topic, have you landscaped your new home, Roberto? Fall is the season for new plants and trees. You're a legend in my bubble of life here on YouTube. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, the landscaping guys uh, come by and they've been doing some work, so that's always good. Um, what are your videos? What are your thoughts on videos between three to five minutes long? If that serves the audience best, then that's fine. If that serves the audience best, then that's fine. So in terms of YouTube, YouTube offers multiple options uh, for monetization. Um, and you can you can see the majority of it here. So what does YouTube offer? Watch page ads, shorts feed membership, uh, shorts feed ads as well. So that's two memberships. Supers come in three flavors. Supers come in super chat, super thanks, and super stickers. So right off the bat, you have one, two, three, and then there's another three here. So that's six. YouTube shopping has two features. It has the merch shelf, so that's seven, and then it has product tagging, so that's eight. Then brand connect, so that's nine. Uh, giving is not really um, a for you thing. It's a fundraising thing, um, so there's that. But something that's not mentioned here is under watch page ads, you also have YouTube premium. And so under that, you have YouTube premium, so that's 10 ways to earn. So that's 10 ways to earn. So again, I'm going to count back those 10 ways to earn to you. You have YouTube ads, you have YouTube premium revenue, you have YouTube shorts revenue, you have super chats, super thanks, super stickers, channel memberships, YouTube brand connect, which connects you with sponsors. Then you have YouTube shopping with the merch shelf to sell your products directly under your YouTube channel. Then you have YouTube product tagging, which is YouTube's shopping affiliate program. So that is 10 ways to monetize in the YouTube partner program. It's 10 ways to earn directly on platform in the YouTube partner program right then and there. Most people do not understand that. Now, again, you have to qualify with your 1,000 subscribers, your 4,000 hours of watch time to unlock all your monetization options. You get memberships, super thanks, super chats, and super stickers. So you get those four if you just get 500 subscribers, 3,000 hours of watch time. So they lowered the bar there. But like I said, I showed you some alternatives to this monetization and I showed you directly and exactly what that paid. I showed you what you make on Amazon, Kindle Direct Publishing and how to make money there. I showed you that you can get multiple affiliate software um, affiliate programs with partner stack or go directly to websites. We looked at the Amazon influencer program for affiliate. We looked at Spreadshop and Teespring on print on demand and merchandise that you can use and that directs. Uh, directly connects to YouTube with YouTube shopping for the merch shelf. So that's actually a benefit to make it easier to sell. We talked about using the community tab with that. I showed you the back end of Kajabi and what I make off of digital products, memberships, and selling coaching directly. Again, if you don't do social media coaching, you don't need a big following to do that. You just need some credential and some social proof to do that and to be able to deliver and then to get good reviews from the people you deliver for. Um, so that's very valuable. So like we've covered a massive amount of ways to monetize if you are a smaller channel or a smaller content creator. Um, yeah, I mean, Kajabi is very expensive, but I showed you a lot of other small things. Um, and uh, again, to get ROI on it, it's not very difficult. Um, so, I mean, let me dig into this a little bit. With Kajabi being expensive per month, would it take a ton of time to get a return on investment or into the payments, or should I prepare a load of courses to sell to make a profit? Kajabi's best feature isn't necessarily courses and courses aren't the best thing to load up on if you're trying to make quality courses that are worth people buying. Your best bet with Kajabi would be to make your ROI by getting doing one-on-one -on -one coaching calls and then pricing the coaching calls higher than the monthly fee. And then you know you are getting, if you get one coaching call per month, which would be ridiculously bad at sales, at bad at your job, then you're profitable. Making the money back on Kajabi in 30 days is not something to be scared of, and it's not very difficult. It's just that you need to have one-on-one -on -one coaching as your first thing that you probably offer to prove yourself. Because if you're not good at one-on-one -on -one coaching, why would anyone buy a, co a course from you? The best thing to do is do one-on-one -on -one coaching. If you can do one-on-one -on -one coaching, then you just have to get leads, and then every sale for that one-on-one -on -one coaching is hundreds of dollars. Price it like $2.99 or something. Price an hour or a 90-minute call at $2.99, Probably an hour call at $2.99 is fine. Then whatever you're paying for Kajabi, if you're paying like $1.99 a month, you're profitable by $100 if you get one call, one call. 
if you only get one call in a month, you're not good at selling this stuff. So you wouldn't be good at selling courses if you can't sell your expertise. If you can't sell your expertise for a call, if you can't sell a call, you can't sell a course. That's why I tell people start with coaching versus courses. If you can't sell a call, you can't sell a course. So start with selling a call. You sell a call, you get a lead. You should be able to get one lead a month for your calls, which means you should be able to make over $1,000 a month in profit if you're doing it correctly, because there should be no reason you can't close one call a week in terms of your leads. So you go that direction. That is something you should be capable of. So um, now again, your thing is chess. So I'm speaking in more general terms. So if you're doing chess, um, I don't know if you're like an international or grandmaster, obviously it's easier to sell those calls. So based on your social proof, your social proof dictates the value that you can charge for because the social proof and the scarcity of people that have your credential, the less people that have your credential, the less people that have your results, the higher your price becomes because you become a rare 1% and a 1%er can charge what they like. So the thing is, if you find something that puts you in the 1% of people like, oh, I don't know having 500,000 subscribers on YouTube is actually 0.1% of creators, 0.1% of creators. So if you have a credential that makes you a 1% or a 0.1% or even a top 10%er, it's easier to charge whatever you like. So that makes sense. You have to have some social proof and publicly available credibility to do that. If you can charge 199, 299 for one call, if Kajabi is 199 a month, you break even with one call, you should be able to get four if you're a good salesperson. So um, you could go profitable on that. And then eventually, once you prove yourself and you get reviews for your coaching, reviews for your coaching make it easier to sell a course. Because if you can sell and deliver for one person at a time, then delivering that expertise at scale only and then makes sense. A membership is easier to go to from a course. I mean, not course, sorry, from a coaching, from coaching calls one on one to group membership, affordable access to entry point. Doing either of those or both is ideal. That's recurring revenue on memberships. So then setting up a membership is better for a lot of people. I'm going to do a whole breakdown on memberships. I'm going to teach you the back end of Kajabi at some point. We'll do a workshop. We'll do a workshop on building your own membership site here on the channel. It'll probably a two to three hour workshop, building your own membership website, using Kajabi, teaching you the back end, walking you through it step by step. We'll walk you through pricing. We'll walk you through setting up the offer, building a landing page, designing it, doing the graphics between Photoshop and Canva. The works. So we'll probably do a three hour workshop on that and teach you all how to set up a membership website step by step. That will get you also the most out of your free trial on this kind of thing. Even if you don't use Kajabi, you can apply the lessons. So we'll do that. Uh, we've done a workshop on merch already. So you can watch the replay of that. It was about three or four hours. Um, we'll do something similar for teaching you Kajabi and building your own membership website so you can make money that way, recurring revenue and own everything, not split it 70-30 with YouTube. You own everything. Um, and you can, again, that's why you pay for it. You pay for it so you can own everything. You own all the data, all the traffic, all the analytics. You keep all the revenue instead of saying it's 70-30 with YouTube. The only reason that you guys get stuff for free is because you're splitting it with the platforms. So it's not really free. It's someone taking 30% of your profit and then you're taxed on what's left of that because you don't pay up front. Paying up front's better, but not everyone can afford to pay up front, so I get it. But if you can pay up front, the reason you pay up front and you pay for web hosting and you pay for the services is because you still make out better in the long run than giving up 30% of your overall gross revenue than being taxed on the remainder, because by the time you're done, you have less than 50% of what you made. Think about it. So like, that's why I'm for digital products and owning digital uh, property and assets of your own more so than um, the ad revenue side of things and splitting and profit sharing with platforms. Profit sharing with platforms is great when you have nothing because it's accessible, it's free, you get the resource, you get the traffic, they're helping you. There is value that they bring to the table that merits what they think. But once you've established your name, once you've made a name for yourself, that split of profit and revenue starts to eat away at you and you start to wonder why you don't own the whole thing and why you don't control it and why they can cut you off when they want. So Armed Atlas, my buddy from uh, Twitter, recently monetized the Firearms channel, Next Goal 10K Subs, utilizing affiliate sales. Thank you for helping and keep me motivated. You're very welcome, buddy. Yep. Yep. 
Would it be reasonable to offer a product or service and leave it on display even if you don't drive the leads yet? I don't know why you wouldn't drive the leads though. So I don't know. How do you feel about an off the wall left field channel like urban exploration? My friend um, exploring with Josh um, does it. Um, I think it's very hard to be competitive, but I think it's worthwhile. I think IRL content is the future of YouTube. So um, it's not like I don't think it's viable. I think it's very competitive though. Um, Alex developer says, I already have 6.5K uh, followers on TikTok as a smartphone guy and as a software developer, how can I make money? If you're a software developer, I would prioritize making money as a software developer. Then I would use my skills as a software developer figure out some appliance, some API based thing. I'd build a SaaS product myself. I wouldn't worry about being an influencer. If I had, if I was a better developer, I wouldn't worry about being an influencer as much. I'd build a SaaS product. I'd build a SaaS product. I would use whatever little bit of influencer ability I have to more importantly, reach other influencers, cut them in on affiliate deal, have people with bigger audiences that solve problems and reach people. I would, all right, here's what I would do. I would do what Phil Starkovich did. Still, Phil Starkovich was the original owner and founder of TubeBuddy and a developer and a wonderful human being. And uh, and he sold uh, TubeBuddy to Ben Labs, which is owned by Bill Gates and Microsoft. And so uh, for a large sum of money, undisclosed large sum of money. And here's what I would do. If I was a software developer and a software engineer, I would build a SaaS appliance. I would build a software as a service appliance probably on the back of something popular that I can build an API for something like Shopify, for example, I build some kind of SaaS product for Shopify or for Amazon sellers. Since everybody's getting into drop shipping, I'd probably focus on those two things. I'd probably go and I'd build one that can be for Shopify. Since every, every kid under 20 wants to be like Iman Ghazi and Jordan Welch and uh, become a drop shipper. I go and build something on top of Amazon FBA, I build something on top of Shopify and maybe as a hedge, I also build something on top of eBay, but I focus on those two first and then maybe I get around to eBay sellers, right? So then I build some SaaS appliance and a product suite around those people and around drop shippers and resellers specifically. So I probably de start developing those SaaS products, but I come up with one MVP that I focus on. I come up with one MVP that I focus on. I determine whether it's better for me to go Shopify or better for me to go to Amazon. I probably go with Amazon because more people talk about Amazon FBA for reselling and drop shipping. So I probably go that route. It's also the biggest household name. So I probably build an Amazon appliance for SaaS on top of the API for that. Then I go and I come up with 20 names for influencers, 20 to 100 names for influencers. I reach out to them. I make them my first super affiliates. I make them JV partners. And I tell them as JV partners and affiliates and super affiliates, you'll get 50% recurring revenue on all commissions selling my SaaS subscription model product, 50% uh, commissions for life, for life. And I get those 100 people and probably 20 of them are really good and really great products, products, uh, product sellers and really good partners. So then I have my um, 20 to 100 people with my 20 top dogs, probably my five in the leaderboard out there making me a killing because I get 50% commissions on the software that I developed for this thing and the advocacy. It then makes me one of the market leaders. It gets everybody talking about it. Their audiences have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that want to emulate them. Each of them probably has a thousand people that they really inspired that will really do it. So each one of those people is worth a thousand sales to me. So between my top 20 influencers that each get me a thousand customers in sales, even if after I pay out for them, if my net profit per month was still only $5 commissions after all of my expenses on every one of those people, I've got 20,000 people paying $5 a month on a SaaS product after I pay out my half of my chameleon efficiency and everything like that at 20,000 times five, that's a hundred thousand dollars a month for my SaaS product in potential net profit after paying out my affiliates. Then I have whatever my ancillary costs are on the back end for hosting, deployment, bandwidth, so on and so forth. So I'm probably not met netting six figures a month, but I'm probably definitely netting high five figures a month, definitely making six figures a year on the SaaS thing, can infinitely scale it and then get run my numbers up once I get to uh, and then that's not counting any of the few people that are probably a premium level person where instead of making $5 after all expenses, maybe for those people, I'm making uh, 20 to 50 off of instead of off the 20,000, maybe it's 200 of those. So it's like, you know, like uh, roughly, what is that? Um, like 
two one percent of those people are premium so 200 200 that i make 50 off of on the enterprise level they're worth another ten thousand dollars a month right there so they're worth six figures a year on top of that so at that point what are you netting quarter mil a year quarter mil a year after uh before tax quarter mil a year before tax on a SaaS appliance leveraging influencer marketing having a robust affiliate program 50 percent commission affiliate program you're going to end up with more than your top 100 affiliates you're going to end up with thousand micro affiliates those thousand micro affiliates are each going to at least get you some more sales if each of those 1000 micro affiliates are able to add to you even 10 new customers a month 10 new customers per month over the course of a thousand of your micro affiliates that have a lower commission than the super affiliates that probably have a 30 percent then you're making what seven dollars per head off of a thousand micro affiliates bring you 10 new customers ten thousand new customers per month you run up to a hundred thousand customers a month if your average on that is six dollars in profit before the rest of your expenses and taxes let's even break it down to where it goes like oh like you got a hundred thousand people and what your average net profit off it ends up being like what four change or something like that then you have taxes and stuff like that again at that point it's not a quarter mil after uh pre-tax it's a, it's over a quarter mil post-tax probably takes you what 18 24 months to get to that at scale with a robust affiliate program how long to develop eight months turnaround so 36 months to over quarter mil net profit after tax income after expense running a SaaS product, why the hell would I worry about growing a TikTok audience if I was a developer? Why would I run it? Why would I worry about growing a TikTok audience if I'm a developer? See, that's why this is the one skill that I don't have that I would need to be a god. And then if you're making that kind of run rate, you could easily exit your business once you get it up to once you, if you run that business after that initial three years for another for another three years and you grow at a decent rate and you get your customer list up to a quarter million customers. And with the run rate we're talking about, it's now a seven figure a year business. You can exit for eight to 12 X clear 8 million, 12 million on that business if it's generating 1.7, 1.5 uh mill in um gross if it grosses 1.5 mil if it's grossing 1.5 mil or more a year at that point you can sell a SaaS company like that at 8 to 12x at this current market then by the time you exit and after you pay your taxes you're sitting on lifetime retirement money because what are you clearing six five six six point five mil after uh taxes on the sale you're set for life at that point if you invest properly invest properly you can screw doing a four percent drawdown if you wanted but like a four percent drawdown on that is a more than healthy enough um lifestyle at like six mil five mil or whatever like if it's like five six mil you do a four percent drawdown what are you getting like after capital gains you get to live off of two hundred thousand dollars a year in interest if you want to you could do a, like live a modest lifestyle at 100k and do a two percent drawdown pay minimal capital gains tax and still always have profit if you invested into tech and into SaaS yourself instead of using a modest like you know six percent return is probably closer to what a 10 12 percent return on average every year annualized return so then taking two three percent to have a six-figure lifestyle is nothing you still have more than six percent gains after that four percent in a down market what are you talking about set for life set for life seven eight years to get there using the skills of a developer building a SaaS appliance on top of one of the most popular things in the world and that was off of one mvp we didn't even account for me saying build a software suite that's one mvp you do another M instead of one mvp you build a software suite you double up and you make this appliance not only for amazon fba you make an appliance for shopify then you make one for ebay and that's your suite and that's if you only make one appliance that's only if you make one api appliance each of those if you can make subsidiary products and um, add some extra value there, um, have some higher enterprise level product, um, then you definitely, definitely go much higher than that. Then you have a much bigger exit. And then instead of a um, seven figure exit, you could have a eight figure exit. It'll be low eight figures maybe, but you'd have an eight figure bit, uh, exit. And then you retire on eight figures after taxes on it. That probably makes a lot of sense. 
You don't have to be a unicorn and sell a unicorn company. You don't have to cry if someone else runs the business up to being nine figures. Who cares? You're set for life. So if I was a developer, if I was a developer, screw TikTok. I don't need TikTok. I can use people who've already built a following. I could just build um, a SaaS appliance. Why wouldn't I just do that? Yeah, software skills, like software skills are overpowered. Like it's God tier skills. It's the one thing that I regret not going harder on. Um, I dabble with my coding. Uh, so yeah. This info is gold. Yep. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, you know, um, this is where business owners leverage people who have the execution ability. This is why somebody who is an entrepreneur that hires a developer will be rich and a developer that doesn't have entrepreneurial uh, tendencies or understand the business or doesn't have a vision. See, here's the difference. Someone can have the skill to execute, but not the vision. That's what makes somebody a highly valuable employee instead of a millionaire. Someone could be get, getting paid. You can hire a developer, paint a vision for them, pay them 60, 70, 80 grand a year, and they'll be very comfortable with a salary. Meanwhile, the bit, the boss is a millionaire, a billionaire because they have a vision. And because the thing is the person with the skill to do it never had the vision, never had the leadership and never had the business savvy and had other uh, things that they prioritized. So that would be the difference. That is why an entrepreneur and a CEO, as much as people resent it, as much as people resent it, think about it. They are smarter if they can think of what I just thought of, because again, the people who have the skill to execute it don't have the vision and the intelligence in the other category that they need of creativity, problem solving, market dynamics, logistics, leadership, um, to be able to um, cast that vision. And then the uh, ability to be able to build an infrastructure that supports the employee to execute on the vision and to resource it and to allocate the resources where needed, let alone acquire the resources to deploy. That is why um, the allocation and the ability to be a resource allocator and a capital allocator is such a highly developed thing. As much as people resent how much money the managerial class makes, how much money CEOs makes, Think about what I just said and why it's more valuable to have the foresight and vision to scope out an eight. I just thought of an eight figure business exit strategy at a glance. And I can still, and I can think of a lot of the devil in the details in it and everything like that off of the skill and the back of what one person's skill has and the ability to reverse engineer it from things that I know and that I've seen. Do I have the ability to code it? No. But the ability to code it is worthless without the vision, the execution, the leadership, and then knowing the details that I would know of executing and building that deal and knowing where to look and how to problem solve. Because again, if a developer knew those things, they would have done it. So again, and then the, the capital to free up the time to do it and then to acquire the other resources, acquire the hosting, the bandwidth, the API um, access, all of those things and everything like that. That's not something that the developer thinks about how to do as scrutinizingly as the entrepreneur thinks to do. Because again, it's about managing all the moving parts versus executing on just the code. And then there's thinking about the business implications, the relationship. What do I do if I lose API access? How proprietary can I make this? How can I patent this thing? So on and so forth. How do I protect it? How do I build a brand name? How do I build a trademark? How do I build the marketing? Who are the 100 influencers? How do I vet them? How do I build an affiliate program? What software do I use to build the affiliate program off the back of that comes in a box? How do I do that? How do I manage affiliate payouts? What's the payment cycle? What's the schedule? The entrepreneur thinks about these things and knows these things. The developer does not have to do these things. The developer has to think about how to build the product. And that's why the CEO makes more money. And I know it triggers some people to think like that and say that, but you know, it's the truth. And I just pointed it out. It's like in, in like very short time. So it just is what it is. Boy, do I wish I knew how to program. Yep. No, nah, I hear you.
You have 7K subscribers. What should I doing outside of just uploading videos? Well, we covered this in the beginning of the uh, stream. In the beginning of the stream, especially for tech, you should absolutely be doing the Amazon Influencer Program. Aside from uploading videos, you should be posting it in your community tab. And we showed how you can do that. And you can make lists. You should also consider doing Amazon live streams for their thing. And you should consider doing upload review videos to Amazon for the Amazon Influencer Program and make the affiliate commissions there. You also should consider if for the tech side, if there's any SaaS programs, software as a service programs, and you should look at partner stack for some of those and then make affiliate commissions linking out to those and managing it all there in one interface. So that could be really helpful. So you have two different affiliate programs there you could go for, and you could look at that besides just uploading the videos and um, doing that. And so you also want to consider using YouTube's built-in um, tagging products program. You may not qualify for that because right now it's a slow rollout and you need 20,000 subs, I think, for it. But other than that, you should consider that. You can still YouTube channel memberships and Super Chats as well. So those things. But I would also focus strongly on getting to 10K subscribers since less than 10% of creators do it. Any insights on how to approach pricing for courses? Um, look at the market and then look at what premium is and look at what moderate is. Don't try to be the low price leader when it comes to courses. And then if you think you can do high quality courses and you can make them as good as a YouTube video with this kind of quality, then um, it's fine to charge $500 for courses for some of them. You could do some entry level courses that might be 199, that's fine. But don't try to be the low price leader. There's not a lot of, there's no value in screaming, hey, look at me, I'm cheaper than the other guys. Um, that doesn't inspire confidence to say, hey, I'm the bargain basement uh, course here. Um, so that's not necessarily a great idea. Uh, the main thing is to scope the market, what it will support, the competition, who is the market leader. And then I would only compete with the market leader, to be honest with you. I would only try to, position yourself against the market leader and I would charge the same as the market leader and then make my thing better or I would charge slightly more and make my thing better come in at the price right the same price and make your thing better um if you're going to be underpricing them only slightly less and then offer more because that's more compelling What if I'm both a programmer and a marketer? I already got some money from TikTok and finding investors where I live is much harder than the US or other developed countries. Um, I think it's hard to be as skilled at both as possible, to be very honest. And like I said, growing your own audience and making money off TikTok, it's not a lot of money, not for what you need in the Western market. It, it's much more practical to get jobs for programming instead of finding investors. Instead of finding investors, get clients in the US, do something for a client in the US, make some money, use that, build a war chest, and then use that war chest and use that money, which will strictly outpace any of the money you think you're making on TikTok in US dollars. Just find online jobs, do Fiverr, be a developer on Fiverr for US clients only, make money with US and UK and Canada clients, make thousands of dollars, Use that to fund your venture instead of worrying about getting investors right away. Build an MVP. Then you can try to source investors in the US off of that MVP. If you're a marketer, if you're a marketer, then I wouldn't even bother worrying about TikTok. What I would do is I'd build my personal brand as a developer if I'm a marketer, build it for the Western market, build a personal brand, use my marketing savvy, build my personal brand and my social proof in the Western market, get Western clients, perform very well for those Western clients, use that to build my war chest. Then those clients can build me a network. That network can get me investors. That network of investors can take a look at my MVP, come in early, do equity. Then I JV partner and use my marketing skills, the JV partner with the right influencers, use the influencers to scale, do the affiliate program, do the thing that I said. This is amazing, good information. I'm a software engineer. I'm only thinking about making my own apps, making one for another company that is already big. I haven't considered, yeah, using something API side to build an appliance or a plugin. Again, build an appliance or a plugin. TubeBuddy and vidIQ are built as an appliance or a plugin off of the surface of the YouTube public API. The YouTube public API, any developer could build something robust on top of that, then build their own scripts and code and things like that, leveraging the API doing um, very specific things. And then all of a sudden, you've got a, a SaaS appliance for YouTube content creation. And there's 100, YouTube, 100 million YouTubers worldwide. 
Um, and so then all of a sudden, if you get a small portion of that, if you get the like, you get the 3 million creators that are serious, the 3 million or so, 3 million, 4 million people in the partner program that are serious and everything like that. Oh, well, that's a lot of potential customers for the free version of your appliance. If then like literally what um 10 percent of them pay you like have what three hundred thousand paying customers at that point that's worth some money so again even if it wasn't even if it's thirty thousand paying customers thirty thousand customers they're paying out of the three million youtubers is like you sorry youtube partners out of the three million youtube partners okay like thirty thousand is one percent of them so if, if it's one percent of them even then if they're actually paying and if they pay something and it ends up being like five bucks a month or something like that, that's like money. That's $150,000 a month run rate. That's a seven figure business. I mean, sheesh. Yes, all that does take time, which is why I said in the meantime, there's ways to make money. There's ways to make money in the meantime. That's And I showed you them. And I showed you they can do them as a small creator. And I showed you the various dashboards. Um, I showed you the various dashboards of where there's opportunities and stuff like that. We looked at things like uh, Partner Stack, for example. Uh, we looked at you know the different things in their marketplace with different affiliate programs bounties and commissions. So partnerstack.com is really good. We looked at like what it's possible to do with print on demand with uh, Teespring and Spreadshop. So we looked at that and that you can make money off of t-shirt sales. We looked at the royalties for doing book sales in Amazon KDP over a year with my book sales and stuff like that. I didn't even do as good of a job as uh, promoting it as I should have. And I didn't release an audiobook or I would have made three times this money if I released the audiobook version, which I haven't done yet. So we, you know, we looked at that. We looked at how some of my offers work, even my $9 offers work on the back end of Kajabi versus uh, my membership uh, as far as having um, my own group private membership and stuff like that. But even $9 products can make you money and make you money better faster than you can with youtube again you to make ten dollars on youtube you're gonna need for most of you you're gonna need maybe five thousand views on a video what's easier to get five thousand views on a video um to to get uh ten dollars or one sale of a digital download uh which one's easier to get so um we looked at that we looked at long-term SaaS affiliate commissions even on small products um with tubebuddy and how well i've done with that over the years and and how well the things so like we've gone into it and i've been super super transparent with you probably more so than almost any other creator has shown the back end of their income streams and their businesses and again we even went into amazon influencer and we looked at the amazon influencer program and i showed you what some of the most uh profitable tech items can be and what their commissions and payouts are and we went even into uh, the bounty commissions that they have on their different programs, like the free trials for Audible, the free trials for Kimball, the free trials for Prime. So um, again, small money along the way, funds your war chest, build your opportunity to make um, massive potential amounts of money later. Um, think about it like this. With me with Awesome Creator Academy, Awesome Creator Academy, we're going to sell courses soon. We haven't done that yet, but we're going to sell courses soon. But we have several digital products that we sell, plus the two coaching office hours for our group members, two live coaching calls, private a week, Tuesday and Thursday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we have the Academy membership, and we have the all access past all our digital products. That's great for retention. We have like 80 members in there now. Right now, the price might change later for new people, but right now it's $59 a month. Think about it like this. If we had... 200 members on our $59 a month group coaching program. That is almost $12,000 a month. That's $144,000 a year before we get into micro transaction sales that we could be getting, that we could be getting. Let's say on our low ticket items, we're not doing this now, but let's say on our low ticket items, we started growing our um, base by moving 500 units of our low ticket $9.99 products every single month. If we did 500 units across that 
because we sell multiple $9 products. If we did that across our three $9 products, we add another 4,500 revenue. We're not doing that right now. I'm just saying for the sake of argument, what if we scaled that? What if we were able to do that? Well, that means that we can also across those products, it may not even be that those are individual customer sales. It might be that they double down and they do order bumps, but that's $4,500 potentially through new acquisitions a month on that, which would then over the course of a year, that's another 45K on top of the um, 145 there, that's a $200,000 a year. That'd be doubling what we do now, but that's the model. The model would be moving from like 85 uh, members that are paying to 200 members that are paying over the course of what, 18 months, goes to 144 in ARR. Then we do individual product sales on our low ticket items. If we can manage $500 a month, uh, sorry, 500 units a month, 500 units a month sounds like a lot. It's literally only about roughly... 18 sales a day of $9.99 products, we can scale that. How much traffic do we need to do 18 units a day? If we look at how much traffic we need to do 18 units a day, if we consider a 0.1 conversion rate, then that means that we literally need to drive um, 18,000 hits a day. If we tried to do that, and if we're doing that off of... um, um CPM rates for banner advertising in the Google ecosystem. Um, we're then we only need okay, we're doing CPMs. Um, so that's like 18,000. So we'd go 18. And what do we pay uh, for a uh, thousand CPMs? I mean, by YouTube standards, it could probably be less than a dollar, to be honest. But let's just say we went more than that. Um, because we need 18,000, 18, if we did literally a CPM that cost us $3 CPM, it's literally $54 a day, $54 a day to get those 1800 hits that need to convert at a 0.1, not a 1%, a 0.1% to close that many units a day, which means we're spending less than a hundred dollars a day to do it, which means that our advertising budget would have to be for the month. Um, $1,600. If we spent and said, okay, that's good to allocate towards small product conversions, but let's not even think small product conversions. We go on our $99 products or even the $500 courses when we get ready. And we did a run rate where we spend a hundred dollars a day at a, what, um, like, uh, like $2 or let's just say it's a $3 CPM. If it's a $3 CPM, we spend three um, three dollars CPM, um, hundred dollars a day, um, hundred dollars a day, three dollars CPM. That means that we get to get about like roughly thirty thousand in traffic a day. Thirty thousand in traffic a day with a point one conversion rate um, is going to be still very good for us. So let's even reduce that further and everything like that. Um, on five hundred, if we convert five hundred dollars sales, how much money do we really need to make if we're spending? $100 a day, three, um, $100 a day is $3,000 a month, $3,000 a month. Um, justifying that, let's go, let's say we do, let's say that all we get is one product sale a day out of that. One product sale a day, one $500 product sale a day gives us $15,000 over the course of a year. That gives us about, what is that? What are we looking at? Uh, $170,000 a year off of that. And that's one course. That's not counting other courses if we did that, but we could do it across all courses. Let's just say that's the category. And if our ads, uh, our, our ad spend was $3,000 a month, $100 a day, then we're $12,000 in net profit. If we're $12,000 in net profit, you run that um, 12 months out of the year, 144,000. So if you combine that with what we do on membership, if we scale that and we get to 200 members, then you're doubling that. So then that's 288 if we do that. If you do single small product sales off of that, then we're up to 300K on that. And that's not counting $99 product sales where we could fudge that. And so you, you look at it and it's without being a SaaS company, it's a content as a service company. It's a cast company at that point. So it's a good business model. So that would be the long-term vision I have over the next... 36 months for Austin awesome Creator Academy. In my vision over the next 36 months to scale Austin awesome Creator Academy to doing uh, 300 to 500 in revenue a year. I have a vision and a plan for that. I laid it out right here. Um, but I, what is my plan? Spend $100, not even worry about YouTube traffic. Spend $100 a day on ads. 
for a $500 product, $100 a day in ads, if I make one sale a day, then I'm massively profitable. And I don't need high traffic to do that. The CPM I used was the generous version of a CPM. I could probably go lower, get it higher targeted. It makes perfect sense. So for the person who asked about pricing and course sales, I just outlined the strategy for you. Um, the value is that if we start selling $500 courses, but all access members in the Academy Pro Group get all courses, all digital products, every time we make a new product, we get more one-off one, one -off sales, but our recurring value being almost like an Adobe model makes us more. And people can still buy products if they want to own them. So we do better on that. So that's the model. But then again, that's high concept. I'm, I was trying to tell you guys how you can make money as a small creator, but I went high concept there because I did both. As a small creator, you can go one route, but if you have the leverage and you have the credibility, you can build out bigger systems, bigger products, and you have to think about it. And again, you don't have to necessarily... Um, sell to something that's affordable to every single segment of your audience. If you build a big enough audience of people, 1% or 0.1% of your audience could be more than valuable enough to grow a business. In my mind, the goal is to get your first 100 customers, then figure out how to get your first 1,000 customers, then how to scale that to 10,000 customers. I have sold to 3,000 customers on the back end of Kajabi with Awesome Creator Academy. My goal is to grow that using individual microtransactions and then discounts and things into upsells and so on and so forth to get to a 10,000 customer list, which means every time we release a new item or a new product and we have a 10,000 customer list of buyers, not a contact list, but of buyers, we have a high probability that even if like, let's say it's 1% of uh, 10,000 people, that's a hundred customers. If 1% of um, 100 customers buys a $500 product when we release it, some segment of that every time, then 100 times $500 is $50,000 every time if it's only 1% of people. If it's 2% of people out of everyone who's ever bought for us, then it's $100,000 at every $500 product launch, which is fine. There's a larger segmentation of that, though, that will buy a lower ticket item, and we already know that. So the thing is, out of 10,000 people, we probably convert maybe 5 to 10% on a $99 product launch. Same amount of revenue, though. That's the growth of the ecosystem. That's what having a dedicated customer list is. And we're only going off the people we already sold. We're not talking about a broader contact list, which is why the goal is to get 100,000 leads by having 100,000 contact list, email list. So the thing is, that's the multipliers, that's the 10x, that's the strategy. That takes time though. This is a 36 month plan. So again, I know that this is higher concept, but you could, it's smart, small. I didn't start that overnight. Are ads on YouTube still worth it? Overwhelmingly, yes. Um, and you only pay for ads people don't skip. If you're talking about our, is ad revenue on YouTube still worth it? Yes, but as standalone income, as Chantel Hill says, it's not necessarily as reliable or great. My answer is to build some kind of direct-to-consumer pipeline or a B2B business using your social media to scale that for leads and direct sales or to go to affiliate marketing as a model or even a sponsorship as a model for a smaller content creator, YouTube affiliate marketing and direct individual sales of your own on print on demand, merchandise, digital products and downloads or books is easier money to make than ad revenue. Ad revenue can still be worth it, but it supplements other revenue streams. I recommend building as many as possible or as many as are viable for your niche. Um, Kevin says, I do nature photography channel, but I want to add camping. I do 2.8 K subs, average 1K to 10K views per video. Should I pivot to content more monetizing options and start a second channel? Look, I wouldn't start a second channel until you have 10K. And the thing is, I don't know why you want to add camping. I think you want to add that because you're into it and you're passionate about a YouTube channel that you want to make money from is not for putting everything you're passionate about onto the channel, nor is doing multiple channels because you're passionate about multiple things the viable idea. You only have a limited amount of energy. This is the reason. All of this is the reason nobody gets 10K subscribers on YouTube. 
is because they're distracted by too many things. You have to focus your effort, compound it to get somewhere. I recommend focusing on for on photography and camping for fun. And then if you want to still, I want to share my experiences. I want like share it on Instagram, share it on TikTok, focus the YouTube channel on one thing. Focus the YouTube channel on one thing. I'm a photographer. I'm super into photography. I love nature photography. I have the 200 to 600 millimeter Sony um, lens. If I watch your videos for photography and nature photography, Kevin, I'm not going to watch the camping videos because I want to know how to be a better photographer and I want to be able to capture birds in flight, which I'm currently doing, but I could do better. So I'm going to watch you for that. I'm not going to watch the camping videos. Now, I'm not everybody. There will be 1% of your audience that will watch the camping videos. Maybe 10%. But you will start to feel some kind of way about those views. And so the answer is to focus on one thing. Yep, small products add up. You can sell more uh, $30 than $300. Yep, absolutely. Does not having many likes or comments but high view rates affect my algorithm potential channel boost negatively? No, um, it doesn't. Nope, doesn't affect it. Steve, yeah, let's go. Steve Ram. Um, we I can't wait to have you on the podcast, brother. I just have to get through Vid Summit. I have to get through Vid Summit and then we can do the podcast. So Steve Ram, hope you're doing blessed, brother. Question, are live streams getting pushed? I've noticed a lot of live streams getting really promoted by YouTube a lot across various channels. Yes, and that's why I'm doing them two to three times a week now, my friend. Live streams are the game right now. The ad revenue is great. The replay value is great. The community is great. Super chats are great. Live streams are the most underrated thing in YouTube right now. So absolutely, my friend, absolutely. Would you venture to advertise a product to say one fourth of its potential net worth without being sure it will sell in a timely manner? I have no idea what that question means actually. What is a good niche to get started and do you need artwork for your channel right away? Actually, Eric Johnson, I answered this on our live stream where we dive specifically into finding your niche. Highly recommend that one if you're just getting started. Uh, we also did um, yesterday a zero to 100K deep dive. Um, so I recommend both of those. How important is call to action strategy in your content to grow revenue? How many and how often for a specific product? What's your approach? So my approach is a call to action in the middle, probably again at the very end, but probably the same one. But then I also have the thing I want people to do. I use the pinned comment in YouTube as the call to action that I want. I also use the pinned comment on any post in the community tab to be the call to action that I want. And so that's kind of my approach. And I found that it's super effective. And I found verbal call outs do matter and visual call outs do matter. So if it could be, ver um, it could be visual and verbal, that's ideal. Good question, though. Should you put a podcast on a second channel? If it's a completely different audience, yes. If it's the same audience, then you're fine as long as they respond to long-form content. As long as they respond to long-form content. But if you try it and it doesn't work, give it its own channel. Are faceless channels a waste of time, and are they harder to start? It depends entirely on the creator, depends on their audio quality, depends on their uh, visual aesthetic, and it depends on their voice. And it depends on the niche. It entirely depends on too many things. You can't lump all faceless channels together. A faceless anime channel is not the same thing as a faceless finance channel. It's not the same thing as a faceless movie review channel. It's not the same thing as a faceless gaming channel. So you can't just say faceless channels. You have to be specific. You cannot just say faceless channels. It has to be specific. Are average views per day more important than retention time? No, retention is probably the most important thing along with watch time, session time. Uh, it's probably the most important thing. Probably velocity of videos to some degree, but not as much. Do I think live streams would be beneficial for a cooking channel? Not if you don't have multiple cameras and high production value. If it's not going to be a cooking show, I don't see live streams being that beneficial. I have no idea what that means. If you're saying, what do I think about faceless channels? Again, be specific. 
You can't just say faceless channels. Anyone in the chat asking about faceless channels, you cannot just bloody well say faceless channels. There are too many niches. They are all too different. You can't just say faceless channels like their own, they're their own niche. You have to be specific. What niche? What audience? What's the gimmick? What's the angle? You cannot just say face faceless channels. It'd be like saying online business. What are we even talking about? So you can't uh, you can't do that. Uh, what are your thoughts on teaching a coding and programming uh, courses? It would entirely depend on your credentials for doing it. It would depend on the marketing strategy, obviously. Um, I think it's good. Less than 1% of the human population can code. So it's a high value skill. People will acknowledge it as a high value skill. It's a six figure skill. So the thing is, I don't think it's a difficult to um, prove the value of it. However, there's so many free things that you have to explain to people. Okay, what am I getting versus free content? So you have to have something compelling. Your own social proof credentials might be the thing that is then compelling or the simplicity of actually being able to learn and execute and the projects that might be associated with it. Um, some backing from a company or a boot camp or something might be more helpful. So then that's a branding issue because the problem is, the problem with selling co coaching and courses in general is so many people have been convinced by false rhetoric that free is the only thing that matters and that everything free is better than thing paid better than paid things. Yeah, some of my free information might be better than some people's paid courses. Here's the problem with that. Even if I believed my free information is better than somebody's $500 course, do you know what the problem is? When are you finding me? And how are you finding me? And is my information teaching you perfectly or is it also leveraging what gets me the most out of the YouTube algorithm? The problem with free content is free content is meant to leverage the YouTube algorithm and the TikTok algorithm. It's not optimized to teach the learner the best way to learn. It's optimized to give the creator the most revenue and the most attention. A course has to deliver on teaching the learner best to get good reviews and not to trigger refunds. There are no refunds on free YouTube content. And therefore, its only real value is how free and accessible it is. It's not curated, and it doesn't sit there and go in the right order. And it's not optimized for learning. It's optimized for YouTube's algorithm, and it's optimized for the benefit of the creator's ad revenue. Direct sales are simpler because then you have to actually focus on product quality. YouTube content doesn't have to focus on that. It focuses on retention rates, which is a form of quality, but the outcome is not about learning. The outcome is about holding attention. Completely different objective, right? So that's the problem with the product. The product of free content is optimized for retention, not for the outcome of the learner. The course benefits the most from a good outcome of the learner to get a good review and a good testimonial and to get promotion. So the incentive structure is different. That's why I believe paid courses to be superior because I look at it like this. Public school versus private school. The only benefit of public school over private school is you don't pay for it. If everyone had unlimited money, they would just go to private school. If everyone was rich, we'd just do private school. We just pay for the best teachers, best tutors. If you had unlimited money, you'd hire a tutor for your kid, right? The only good thing about public education is that it's free. All things being equal, someone who's good at public school was already smart. Someone who's not already smart can go to a tutor and private school and then get a better outcome than somebody who benefited from public school. It's going to be repeat the pattern. So if you look at it as public education versus private education, we all know that all things being equal, if we had unlimited money, we'd all choose private education over public education. We all know that. So we rationalize and tell ourselves how great free content is because it's what we can afford. When we can afford anything in the world and money is no object, we might use free content, but we'll always get the paid resources. And we know that private versus public. That's the tipping point, right? So you have to learn how to message and market effectively, but honestly, and use that to get people weaned off of free and then make them understand the value of the private school education that you offer. So you position yourself as public versus private and you deliver on public versus private. You're welcome, Citizen Lou. And oh, lead attorney, shout out. Yeah, we should do something. We're both in Atlanta. Uh, I'm working on something with YouTube. Maybe we'll they'll help us host something local. We'd love to um, see you there. Uh, shout out to lead attorney. Thank you for showing up and always supporting me. You've always been a really big supporter. You do so much for the community, and I just appreciate you. Tyson Jordan Jackson says, I'm thinking of starting a channel that focuses on logistics and supply chain management. 
That's very hyper niche. And my curiosity is what the market would be for that. I'm not saying there isn't a marking for it. I just am not familiar with what would be a market for that. Yep. We're almost to a uh, 600 K consistency does win the game. Yeah. Um, less than 0.1% of creators ever get to 500 K. So really excited that we're getting um, higher up there, thinner and thinner air, thinner and thinner air, 1% better every day. That's the goal. That is the goal. That is the plan here. So, yep. All right. So there's there's a lot we covered. I guess I could answer a couple of questions. Um, let's see. Modern Media Maker says, with a big push for automated workflows and faceless, quote unquote, faceless channels and AI text to video and YouTube adding some AI research tools, how do you feel this affects creator authenticity? Why should creators show their face? Because nothing will ever truly replace a human being. AI is still way too early to fully replace a human being. Quebo Cop AI kind of proved that not everyone also resonates with it. Um, there's some uncanny valley stuff there, quality control. And there are such thing as these like AI and virtual influencers. VTubers are close, but they're not quite there. There's still a human behind that avatar and they're still doing a lot of the performance um, so I don't think we're quite there. And the thing is, we haven't seen the ability of these things to go to like 10 million. So they will not be the dominant and preeminent culture as long as the status, as long as the top, as long as the top 1000 uh, creators, as long as the top 1000 creators in the market, over 10 million subscribers are human beings and we know their face and we can see them then the influence of AI and automation will be very limited. And yeah, you might get a couple of channels, a handful of channels. They get to a million K, a million subs off of it. You'll get a couple to get to 100K. But the reality is the preeminent market will always be with these human beings and human beings can always adapt in a way better than this. And the automated workflows, there's a limit to how well they can compete with a real creator and real creators can innovate. And the thing is, it's, it's people looking for a solution that says that they're not a creative problem solver. And ultimately... It'll beat a lot of YouTubers because a lot of them are just not CEOs and they're not higher thinking and higher functioning and higher frequency. However, somebody that's very clever, very creative, very innovative um, will not be beat by the simulation of the AI and will not resonate with people and will not be able to build community. It'll get audience, but it won't have community. It's not going to be good at replying to comments. And even if you build a team around that, there's not going to be a singular cohesive message or voice that makes people feel welcome. So the thing is, Human beings will never be led. You can't get, you cannot build an AI or a robot that will be able to lead an army of humans passionately into battle or make them do anything. You cannot do that. Not yet. Anyway, not yet. Maybe if an AI was an AI propagandist exclusively, theoretically, maybe you could get a charismatic virtual dear leader on the screen that would lead a couple hundred thousand chuckleheads in the battle, but probably not really. Uh, you still need a human being, a flesh and blood human being, and the charisma and the confidence and the adaptability of that to truly lead humans. And that's the only thing that can lead communities. There's not enough weak-minded people that would be led by an AI as far as a community and would feel liked, loved, respected by that. Um, we're not there yet. 15 years, give me another ring on that. Maybe even five years, give me another ring on that, but we're not there yet. Definitely not for 10, 15 years, I would hope, um, unless the doom comes much sooner than that. But even if you look at science fiction and everything, we like we just probably wouldn't do it. We, we still need and care about a person that we relate to, and an AI can't cut it. And again, even if you have an AI that does, there will be... Like, there will be something that is superior like there'll be a human that'll be better than the ai a, a human will beat the machine um it'll be rare it'll be rare but the human will be the machine it can replace us at grunt work it can replace us at some very like surface level things it can replace us at surface level things but the top tier things the creativity can't do it not yet not close it's a tool, but it can't it can't beat a human. It can serve humans. 
Um, it can outperform it in certain areas. It can outperform it as you in certain areas, but a full on, full on replacement. It's not a replacement. We create too much value still. We still create too much outsized value that's too variable and adaptable for them to keep up with. It is good at scaling things that we do. It's good at scaling things that we do, but just doing them outright, maybe not so much. Maybe not so much. So again, something to uh, consider. AI can help avoid mistakes out of tiredness and things of that kind can lead and creation still remains human. Yeah, something like that. All right. I think that's a good place to bookmark it uh, for tonight. I think that two hours is um, good for this one versus doing a crazy uh, three hour, four hour stream. Speaking of streams, I want to thank our friends over at StreamYard, uh, the easiest and simplest solution in live streaming linked in the description down below for all of you to check that out. And of course, as usual, we're going to end the night with my book trailer links to all the things. And if you want to check out Awesome Creator Academy, that is also linked in the uh, description down below. You can join us in the pro group or buy any of our great digital products. Uh, we have a brand deals course coming soon. You can also buy the brand deal starter kit, YouTube starter kit links down below. Any discount codes are down below as well. Thanks everybody for all the super chats. Thanks for all the comments, great questions and all the love. I'll catch you on the social medias. And I uh, will let you know when we schedule the next stream. We'll probably still try to do something while I'm at Vid Summit, or we'll do it before I head out to Vid Summit. But we'll just end the night with my book trailer reminder to buy my book and to review it in Amazon if you haven't already. Create something awesome how creators are profiting from their passion in the creator economy. I will catch you guys on the next video or stream. We'll see which one comes out. Take care. I finally did it. I finished my book, Create Something Awesome, How Content Creators Are Profiting From Their Passion in the Creator Economy. The book is available now in paperback and in Kindle where you can read it on any e-reader or device. And I'm really excited about this. The audiobook is coming soon, probably October 2022. Oh my God, it's so great to be able to have this book done put it up on the bookshelf and to know that all of you who appreciate it, you want to hear what I have to say about the creator economy, becoming a full-time content creator, and what the experience and lifestyle of being a content creator actually is like. Uh, this is the book. I, I put 20 chapters in here of the most important things I think that content creators could be focusing on today. I talk about the mental health aspect of being a content creator, uh, getting discouraged, imposter syndrome, not charging what you're worth, and mostly actionable advice around monetizing your content properly, but also how to build an audience on your authenticity and what it's really like to start from zero, even today. So if you're interested, make sure you're checking out the book. You can order it on Amazon. You also probably order it in a lot of other places like Barnes and Noble, and it will be coming to other bookstores soon. Really excited about it. Thank you for all the support and love around the book and the positive reviews. Now go ahead and pick it up and make sure you go out there and create something awesome today. Take care.